Change is possible, my friends. How do I know that? You'll know soon enough. Hello, fellow Skilloper. Welcome to Skillup Academy. Today we have Brian Penny joining us to talk about mental models. And there's no better example of how change is actually completely possible. I'm going to show you one little thing. Brian doesn't, doesn't even know. I'm going to show you this thing here uh, to prove you that it's possible. All right. So you guys see the image? This is Brian's website, so brianpenny.com. So I'll link in the description below, but the picture is actually him in the bottom left corner. So uh, 15, he was a heroin addict for 15 years and he's been clean for, I think five years now. So change is absolutely possible. And there's no, there's no story that I know of that's more inspiring than Brian's story. And I've known him for six months now and his growth has been phenomenal. And I'm assuming part of this comes from knowing more about mental models. So I'm excited to hear it uh, from him. So your time to shine this way, Brian. Thanks so much, Danny. I, I wasn't too sure how you're going to introduce me, but um, I suppose the fact I was a, an addict and now I'm doing this kind of stuff, it, it always pops up. But thanks for the introduction. It was great. I, I might actually, I wasn't planning on bringing in a little bit of story in, but I might try to bring it into the talk as where it suits. I might be able to bring it in um, at the start, actually. But um, what, what I want to get across today is that, um, that my main overriding point is that men mental models are complex, but they're not as complex as people assume them to be. The, the, I, I wrote an article recently called Mental Models for Dummies, and I think it can be, it can be it's, it's what I'm going to be presenting today is more of a beginner's guide. And where I want to start with mental models is a little story. It's, story. it's at the start of Shane Parrish's book. It's a great little story, and it's basically these two little fish are swimming along in the ocean, and they're swimming along, happy, happy out, and a wise fish, an older wiser fish swims past them and says, uh, he goes, how's it going, boys? How's the water? So the little two little fish, young fish, they smile, nod, and swim on their way, and they're swimming along silently in the water, and one of the fish turns around to the other and says, what the hell is water? And that story, I just love that story, and it encapsulates mental models, or encapsulates why we need to use mental models, because the world is super complex, and it's very difficult. The bottom line is it's very difficult to see. Some of, some of the most obvious and important realities are the most difficult to see. And an example of this that um, taps back into my story, which da Danny mentioned there, was I used to live in delusion. I was an addict for 15 years. I did I knew I was an addict. It's God, look at me. I knew I was an addict, but I didn't realize my mind tricked me. I didn't realize how bad I was. I didn't realize that my mind was constantly playing a story of what I had to do, who I had to be, and I didn't see an escape out, out of that. Now, I've since, um, I, I, I since um, work with my own clients um, around different things, life coaching and psychological stuff, and I often ask some of my clients, what's the nature of your self-talk, the inner voice, that incessant mind chatter that never stops and they'd often look up to the sky and say i don't really have self-talk after thinking about my question and i'd literally just say to them who just told you that and they start to look and say wow like so a lot of people are aware of their self-talk but some people are not aware they're compulsive thinkers always thinking the mind is always going and it's begun so much that they don't even realize that it's controlling their behavior and that's an idea of trying to make sense of reality that, that that the story of the fish sometimes it's very difficult to see reality we think we can see it but we don't we're easily filled easily deluded and it was the nature of my life and i wake up every single morning and say to myself how am i gonna try how is my brain gonna try to trick me or delude me today and I, I, i'm super positive i really am a positive person so it's not a negative way of uh, looking at the world it's more of a positive way of looking at the world to to catch the deceptions that our minds play and the complexity of reality plays on us. So that's just the introduction. So now we're really getting into mental models and what a mental model is. To put it simply, a mental model is a psychological explanation of how things work. It's a model of the world. 
and that's all it really is. It, it, mental means it's in our minds, it's in our heads. That's a psychological explanation of how the world works. Um, I'll give you examples now in a second that'll explain it a little bit better. But what mental models do for us is basically, in a nutshell, they help us to make sense of reality. Hence the story at the start, help us to see reality. They also help improve how we think. So they give us advantages on thinking in a different way. And I'll be going into examples of mental models um, at the end of this talk of how do you really supercharge our thinking. That's what I think they really do. They bring our thinking to a new level altogether. Um, another thing to do is they simplify complexity. So the world is super complex, super busy, and it's getting busier every day. So what mental models do, they cut the world up. They, they wouldn't say they cut the world up. They, they simplify the complexity of the world and help us to better understand life. That's the essence of what mental models do for us. So a couple of examples of mental models, just to get the idea across is, and one of them would be supply and demand. And what supply and demand do, does is it helps us to understand the economy. That's all it does. So the economy is a very busy place, like you think of the financial markets and how the economy works. And, and a supply and demand system is that it just explains how the economy works, a very simple understanding of the economy. That's a mental model. Another mental model is Occam's razor. And you might have heard, heard of Occam's razor. Um, uh, was it William of Occam or Warren or something of Occam? And he came up with the idea. And it's breaking down problems to their simplest solution. Now, it's not breaking them down so everything's to the simplest form. It's the simplest way, but not too simple. That's the idea of Occam's razor. And that's just another mental model. So if you are if you have a lot of complexity in your life, say, Boy, what's, the, what's the simplest way we can break down this problem? What's the simplest solution? A great example of this is if you heard um, hoof beats, like hoofs of an animal behind you, think horses, not unicorns. So the simplest simplest solution wouldn't be there's unicorns behind you, it would be the horses behind you, or it wouldn't be zebras. Think of the simplest solution first. That's another mental model. And another really simple mental model that I like is called Hanlon's razor. And that came from, um, it actually came from Occam's razor originally. Um, an idea. And um, what Hanlon's razor means, we should not attribute to malice what can be better explained by stupidity. And what that means is we, we tend to be a little bit, if you are a paranoid person, you're probably thinking the world is being malice or the world that people are being malicious and be, oh, he, he must think that and he must think that. Says, Most people are usually thinking about themselves or I don't like calling people stupid, but at the end of the day, that's what this Hanlon's razor says. Sometimes people are just being unaware. There's a better word, not stupid. They're being unaware. And that's all it is. So sometimes if you're being a bit paranoid and you're thinking someone's being malicious, maybe they have stuff going on in their own life. So Hanlon's razor is just another mental model that really um, lets you understand the world a little bit better. So before I go into a little bit more depth on mental models, something I really I think is important to get across and is that mental models are not reality. They only help us to make sense of reality. So what they are is, is a map of reality. And if you actually think of a map, a, glo a globe, they, they, it's basically a reduction of the world. So if you had a map of America, it's a reduction of what America really is. So by default, because it's a map of what something is, it's a reduction. So it's not reality. So it will never match onto exactly what reality is. Like if a map exactly matched, a map of America exactly matched America, it wouldn't be a map. It would be America. So it literally can't, it, it, it can't be what it is by default. So it's only ever a map of a situation, a reduction of a situation to help you explain what something is. And something else to understand is that sometimes mental models conflict. So you could you'd be using five if you had five or six different mental models in your head they wouldn't because they they're not exact matches of reality sometimes they can conflict as well so and um, that's something to keep in mind so they're not infallible mental models are not infallible and sometimes they conflict sometimes they can match and you, you could have like lots of different met metal models all make sense in the same direction and what charlie munger who warren buffett and charlie munger to be big proponents of mental models what uh, charlie munger says is when loads of mental models go in the same direction and all say the same thing he calls that the lalapalooza effect i'm not too sure where he got the word from but that's what he calls it this is that's that's really when you know you're right and the thinking is really supercharged. So that's something to keep in keep in mind. And 
Another idea is why, if they're, if they're reductions and they don't match, they're imperfect by default, why do we use them? And the reality is that life is just far too complex, far too busy. So what mental models are for? Da, 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 but we, we can't keep all that complexity in our heads. So we use these mental models to break down that complexity into bite-sized chunks that we can use in the real world. And that is really what the essence of mental models. That's why, that's why they're so useful. <clears throat> so... I'm going to get into the next um, point here. And there's a thing I like to say. It's uh, I use it in some of my talks. I deliver these talks in, at corporate events now on mental models. I've done one recently. And the, the idea I like to bring is, and I like to tell people, the takeaway message is stop swinging your hammer. And what that means is there's lots of mental models out there. There's lots of ways of looking at the world. But sometimes we have a mental model in our heads that we we like and we love and we go around and that's our hammer we go around and we go around trying to fix every single solution with that hammer we try to the old adage is to uh, to the man with a hammer everything looks like a nail and what that is is if i use that when i got into um, psychology i done a degree in psychology and i was really big into behavioral psychology and pavlovian conditioning and i was like oh, behavioral psychology is the way the world works and I looked at everything through reward and punishment and Pavlovian conditioning, which are Pavlovian conditioning is a, is a mental model. And reward and punishment, reinforcement, is another kind of mental model, a way of looking at the world. But that was my hammer. I looked at everything through everything through that lens. But the world is, is more complex than that. There's cognitive processes going on. There's evolutionary processes going on. I'll get into it now. You have to think in a multidisciplinary way. There's uh, other psychological phenomena going on. There's, if I'm thinking about the economy or the financial markets, there's economic stuff going on. All of these are different ways of looking at the world, different disciplines. But when we learn one or two disciplines, we tend to look at the world through that discipline with our hammer. And the problem is, it's like if you had, um, let's say, a sh uh, you had a project to do, let's say a working project with tools and stuff like that, and all you had was a hammer, <laughs> you'll be using the hammer to... Um, to stick stiff stuff together if you be smacking screws with the hammer and it's just not going to work very well you need many different tools for the project if you're trying to create let's say uh, build a shed you need many tools and that's the way mental models are that's the way thinking works as well if you want to solve problems you need many many models to solve different problems psychological models economic models and um, taught experiment models all the different kinds of models and that, that 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 you need really that's that's the better way of looking at it and i suppose it comes down it comes uh, nicely into what i'm going to talk about here and it's a multidisciplinary approach you need to have multiple learn about multiple disciplines to learn about the world and to, to view the world through different lenses so let's say if you look at the world through an evolutionary perspective look at the world through a psychological perspective look at the world from an economic social perspective there's different ways of looking at the world and a great way of looking at this would be, let's say an economist um, would look at the world through supply and demand. That, that's his mental model. A behavioral psychologist, like the way I was, still am to an extent, I'd look at the world through incentives and reward and punishment. And but if I only look at the world through that perspective, I will have blind spots because I still don't know much about, I'll be honest, I don't know much about supply and demand. I know the basics of it, but I need to learn more about that. So I have a blind spot in that area. So you need to learn all the different models, all the different disciplines, and th that that's where the mental models really come into their own. So there's a thing called a lattice work. I, I personally didn't know what a lattice work was. I had to look it up online. So a lattice work is basically a mesh, a design a mesh of um, interconnecting metals or materials that meshes together. That's what a lattice work means. I don't know, it's a more of um, an American uh, name. And Charlie Munger actually says that that's the way mental models work because what we try to do is we try to cut up reality through the disciplines. So let's say take psychology or take behavioral psychology with incentives and we try to make sense of it through that perspective. But you can't just grab a slice of the world and make sense of it through that perspective because everything is interconnected. If I make an, um, an econ a financial decision, supply and demand comes in, ec economics come in, behavioral psychology comes in, cognitive biases come in. I could do a thought experiments there. Other, it's another nice mental model. So yeah, I could think about how it, how, how it would go through time. That's a mental model. And they all 
come in together. They're all connected at the end of the day. So what you have to do is you could look at the world through a mental model, but then put it back into the lattice work and see how it relates to other things in the world. Because at the end of the day, everything is, you have to put it back into the interconnected whole to make sense of reality. And that's where the complexity, I think that's where the real complexity of mental models and people struggle to understand not to understand it, but you struggle to get a grasp on that. I think the real struggle is acting with the mental models and using the mental models. But the understanding that you use a mental model and pull it out from, so let's say, for an example, use why did that person behave in that way? So, right, or, yeah, why did that person behave in that way? And you could think in terms of supplying, or you could think in terms of reinforcement and punishment. They were rewarded on previous behaviors, and that's why they acted in that way. But then it could be, it could be a monetary gain. So it could have been a supply and demand uh, situation. I'm actually pulling this um, off the cuff here, so I don't know if that exactly works. But you'd have to think about it from a, from multiple disciplines. That's that's the idea. That's really what I'm trying to get across here. So um, it might make more sense now as well when I talk about different mental models. And um, what I want to I want to talk about four of the most important mental models to me. So I was talking about already um, um, supply and demand, Hanlon's razor. Occam's razor, they're all nice simple mental models, but it gets more complex, thought experiments, so thinking through time and thinking of experiments in your head, that's another another mental model. Um, another one is probabilistic thinking, it's just probability and statistics, that's another mental model, another way of looking at the world, like Bayesian statistics, probability statistics, and these are all just models of looking at the world. But the four that I think are the most powerful I'm gonna talk about now, and basically they are inversion, second order thinking, first principle thinking, and the 80-20 analysis, which people are um, a lot of people are more familiar with. <clears throat> so inversion is a mental model that many people use. We use it by default. And if so, anyone's looking at this, I, I used to use inversion. And but the, the, because I didn't think about it in a mental model way, I didn't use it all the time. But now that I've become to realize it's one of the most important mental models, every time I'm stuck on thinking straight away, I will say, right, go to my mental models, invert. And what inversion simply means is, is to turn upside down. That's all inversion is. Turn your thinking upside down. So if I'm looking for a solution to a problem and I'm thinking, let's say if I want to go, on, the example I use is if I want to go on a date and I really want to make a great impression. So I say, right, what three things can I do to make a good impression? And I might think of three good things, but if I'm a little bit stuck and I don't know what's going to work or just having another way to look at the world, I'll say invert. And I'll say, right, what five things could I do could I not do that would make me look like an idiot? And it just gives me another perspective of looking at the world, uh, looking at the world. So simply inversion means looking at a situation, a problem from the opposite end of the natural starting point. That's all inversion, inversion is. So you simply invert and instead of a great example is Charlie Munger actually says this. Um, he says, tell me where I'm going to die so I'll never go there. So if you want to, um, if you want to get, avoid something, think of where you need to be to avoid that thing. If you want to get something, think of what you should do to not get it. It's just inverting the situation. And inversion is one of the most powerful mental models you can have. It's just we'll be touching on, um, we'll be touching on it at the end. Actually, I think it's linked to creative thinking as well. So the second one is a uh, second order thinking. And second order thinking is literally um, thinking about the effects of the effects. And it's very, I, I know Ray Dalio talks about his second order thinking. He's, he's really big on second order thinking. And it's basically, if I make a decision today and I say, right, um, I, for my for me, I was doing, I'm doing a PhD at the moment and I was going to, I love academia. I, I, I don't love it as much as I did. I love elements of academia, but I have a lot of other great things going on in my life. And I'm saying, do I need to do the PhD? So if I, if I says, well, what's the advantage is I'll have more time to do the thing, the speaking gigs I love now to learn about mental models and all the stuff I love now. But what about the effects of the effects? If I don't do my PhD, I'll have less authority when I'm as a speaker going forward uh, in my career. I will have less less sway. P people won't, they, it just won't look as good on my CV. Just having the PhD gives me that authority to talk about things. So I was thinking about the effects of the effects. So that's all second order thinking really is. And a great way to think about second order thinking is to think about it in terms of deficiencies. And a great example, it's in uh, Shane Parrish's book on mental models. 
And what he says is, years ago, um, we put uh, antibiotics, or uh, yeah, antibiotics into the meats and in, in, into the livestock. We fed fed our livestock with antibiotics to help with the bacteria, and it looked like a no brainer because it would make the uh, the field better, stronger, leaner. It looked lots and lots of different advantages. We're killing the bacteria, but we never looked at the effects of the effects. We only looked at the effects. Better meat, in essence, but the effects of the effects over time was that the bacteria grew stronger, evolved and adapted. And now we have drug resistant bacteria that's in the food chain and we're really struggling with it. It's a huge problem. Now, if we thought about the effects of the effects or the second order effects, or it's not just second order, it's third order, fourth order, nth order. We can't get too caught up into that because you get over analytical about things. So second order thinking is nice. But if you look at the effects of the effect, if we looked at the effects of the effects of that, we would have we would have realized that this would have happened because you don't need to have um, a PhD in biology to know that organisms evolve over time and they adapt. And organisms with a small life cycle adapt very quickly. So looking at it from that perspective, it was obvious that the bacteria was going to adapt, but we never looked at the effects of the effects. And now we're left in a situation that we've it's a very problematic situation. We've drug resistant bacteria that um is not and, and the antibiotics aren't working anymore so that's just an example of looking at the effects of the effects and it's literally think about the consequences of your actions and the consequence of of them effects that's literally what it is but it's a fantastic way of thinking through your problems what i tend to do even as well as i visualize through time and try to picture it. i think it's really really cool way of looking at looking at things and try to put visual, visualize the the actions and it's a nice it's an easier way of seeing it so um, force principle thinking is the next one. That's the third mental model that I love um, using. And force principle thinking is basically just de de deducing down um, it's a problem or a situation down to its smallest parts, the fundamental truths. And it can be a bit complex to explain. I just struggle explaining with it myself, which is just a sure sign that I don't know it as well as I should. But a great example to explain this is um, for, comes from Elon Musk. And Elon Musk, this is the, the, the example everyone uses. And Elon Musk was told when he tried to use SpaceX and launch to the moon, he was told that battery packs um, cost, I think it was $650 or $850 per 650 kilowatt hour or something to that effect. And that's the way they've always been. And that's what battery packs cost. End of story. But Elon Musk uses force principle thinking to a T. And he actually broke it down to its force principles. And it's the best way to explain this. So he says, right, what is a battery pack made of? It's made of nickel cobalt aluminum all these different force principles the, the smaller components and he says right how much will it cost to make that battery to construct it to put it together the construction cost I suppose supply and demand might come into this here another mental model that's where the, the intermix and he found out that um the, the, he, he checked on the london metal exchange and he found out it wouldn't cost that much at all and the price to put it together would not cost that much either and it worked out that he created battery packs for 13% of the price he was told that he could, he'd have to pay. Hence, we have SpaceX and he might go to the moon or Mars, wherever he's gone to. And that's the that's the power of force principle thinking. And from my perspective, I'm, I do a lot of talks and I, I do, I'm, I'm very much into psychological phenomena and stuff. But from my perspective, sometimes instead of going in and saying, will this will this team build an exercise work and you're, it's based on assumptions and beliefs and it's really breaking down assumptions that's the essence of force principle thinking breaking down the assumptions and the fundamental truths that you know are true so sometimes i'll ask myself right is that person trustworthy is that person honest is that person have the knowledge have to have the is he being logical and i break the the, the psychological phenomena down into force principles instead of thinking on, on the bigger scale now this is something i use myself and i need to delve more into fourth principle thinking to find out it's hard to get um it's a, it's a, it's, i'm struggling myself actually to get really fundamental um uh, information on that but that's the way i use fourth principle thinking as well so break it down to it's it's really breaking assumptions down things we assume and beliefs we have about the world to their fundamental aspects let's say a nice example if i'm buying a car and i'm told oh, that car is a great car and it's uh, they get loads of mileage on that well i look i break down the actual fundamental truths of that i look at the diesel the 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 capacity of the engine breaking it down to the forced principles that's the essence of that
So the last um, the last mental model I want to talk about today is the 80-20 analysis or the Pareto principle as it, as it's also known. And this is this is a really powerful mental model because it, it's nearly my go-to force mental model as well to an extent that an inversion. And it's basically I, I, in a, in essence where Pareto, right, was where the Pareto principle came from for people that have never heard about it. And there was a guy called, I think it was Wilfredo Pareto. He was an Italian um, polymath. And he was, um, he was a couple of, th couple of things he recognized was that 80% of the land was in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. Then he also was a gardener as well. And he was a stat statistician as well. But he was also a gardener and he was growing his pea crops. And he noticed that 80% of his crop came from good crop came from 20 percent of the of the what he grew and then he he, re, he realized this was uh, in a lot of places in in the world and he checked out and he says this 80 20 um ratio is 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 very um is is, is around it's, it's it's in many places in the world i can't think of the word right now that's <laughs> a word i'm looking for um <laughs> type it up if anyone, anyone knows what i'm trying to say no um and he found it was everywhere uh, and this principle is used in business and it's used in economics and what they find is in in the business environment they find that uh, 80 percent of your profits come from 20 percent of your customers 80 percent of your of your pain for businesses comes from 20 percent of your customers as well and this 80 20 effect in essence what it means is roughly 80 roughly it is roughly 80 percent of your effects come from 20 percent of your causes and it is rough it can be 90 10 it could be 60 40 but generally speaking there's this um ratio that's always there of 80 20 and it could be let's say 20 percent of your effort produces 80 percent of your gains 20 percent of your sources produces 80 percent of your happiness and i use this a lot i often am um, do worry what 20 percent of my life is making me really really happy what 20 percent of my life what i'm working on right now is giving me 80 percent of the energy or the the good stuff in my life the, the results i'm getting and what that then gives you is you can double down on the 20 percent that's why you double down on the 20 percent and what i've done with mental models is i got the idea of a guy that danny knows as well as called michael simmons a great guy you should follow him for mental models some fantastic uh, articles on medium about mental models and he has a mental models club as well but he done an analysis and i, I, I copied his idea and do an 80 20 analysis of all mental models because there's about there's thousands of mental models so i took the mental models that seemed to work for me and i i, I was i took the, the mental models i was playing i was playing around with about 100 mental models and it says right 80 20 analysis what ones are working great for me now then i done an 80 20 analysis on them 20 and i say right what four or five really work and i ended up using i end up using now about seven or eight mental models that i use all of the time and i'm building on it all the time i don't know 10 I, I use regularly enough because of using the 80 20 analysis and it's just it's a really powerful mental model to see where the gains are in your see what is really big giving you your big gains so to double down on them to get bigger gains and that's that's really the um the, the, the they're the four mental models i really wanted to talk about so i think uh danny's gonna jump in with a, a couple of questions now if i am correct hey i'm back hey danny how's it going <laughs> thanks brian i i actually Cheers. uh it was always hard for me to under, understand where mental models models came from and how how i can actually uh implement them which w what are they and all that kind of stuff so I, I think so far uh you've got you've got the title for the easiest explanation cheers uh, <laughs> using using the the fish story and the hammer story uh it really helped understand everything cheers. and the mesh uh, the mesh yeah. yeah, I have taken all of them from different aspects, but it's nearly taking the simplest things and putting them together. Like, you know what I mean? I, I'd love to get, I, I'd love to get, if, if any of the, the main mental model guys out there hears this, I'd love to, love feedback on it. I love negative feedback, by the way. That, I think that could be a mental model. <laughs> it should be. It should it, be, it yeah. It really yeah. should be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you answered a lot of my questions, but more questions kept coming in, so. Super, super, <laughs> sure. I love, I love, uh, yeah. On so the, you mentioned you mentioned um, some specific cases where we're uh, to use them, but on a general sense, so I'm living my day to day life, and and people in the chat as well, and people watching uh, the recorded version on YouTube, they're uh, just living their regular life, and 
when can they think of a moment that, oh shit, I should use a mental model? Is it, is it when there's a, uh, is there a trigger that says that, oh shit, yeah, I should, I should think about using a mental model? Yeah, and, and <clears throat> this is probably the most difficult thing. And what, what I found in my life has been like, um, the, the more, you, and, and it's chicken and the egg, the more you use them, mm. the more you're, you're naturally triggered to use them more. So for me, um, what I found was anytime, the best trigger could be a difficulty. So if you're struggling, let's say you're, you're stuck, you're feeling stuck in your thinking, say, right, what mental models can I use? Now, even though I have the knowledge of the mental models, still sometimes when you're stuck, it's the nature. And it's this, it's, you know what, it's back to the fish. If I'm stuck on a problem and I'm not thinking of mental models, I'm that little fish not knowing where the water is. We're not seeing reality. The mental models are there. So I would say for starters, if you want to get going, pick one mental model and get into the habit of using that one mental model. I'd advise you to start with inversion or the 80 20 analysis because mm -hmm. we have so many problems in your life. And can you just fl flick the switch? So let's say today, or let's say uh, off the top of my head, um, today, I uh, can't really think of an example. Right at the moment, right, 80 20 is the other best mental model. And let's say right now, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very busy right now. And I'm getting, I wouldn't say I'm getting overwhelmed because I practice a lot of mindfulness and awareness, which is another key point, which I'll get onto now in a, in now in a moment too, which is really key. Because the more aware you are, the more you will use the tools at your disposal. But for me right now, because I'm feeling a little bit over overwhelmed, that could be me trigger. I'm getting overwhelmed. Say, right, let's do an 80 20 analysis on what is giving me the most gains right now. And so, what 20% is giving me the most gains? And what uh, uh, the eighty percent against, and what twenty percent is giving me the eighty me eighty percent of pain, the stress that I'm using. So you can nearly use being stuck as the trigger. But as we all know, that's not going to be enough because the essence of being stuck is you won't think of a solution. So what I would say to people right now is put it, put something in your phone, learn the mental model, put it in your phone, put it in your laptop, put reminders around in certain areas. So use your environment, use a behavioral perspective to change your environment, to use the mental model. And what I found happened for me is I te I've tended, the mental models I've used, I've sort of internalized. So I've caught myself, oh wow, I'm using the mental model and I didn't even realize I was using the mental model. So they've become internalized. So I'm now trying to dig deeper into mental models to use more of them to internalize more. So it was Adam Robinson that actually told me, I, I asked him a similar question. He says, oh, well, they're sort of internalized for me. But I suppose the trick is for people is to build awareness. That's the key point. And um, so when you do catch yourself to use, use a negative trigger point as the cue to use a mental model. And any time for creativity, if you're stuck on a problem in work or at home, sit, invert, always invert. So if you want to get to the bottom of something and you want an answer, you'll go to the natural starting point. So just say, instead of that, invert the problem. What do I want to avoid to get where I want to go? And it just lets let you think outside the box and laterally think. But I would use the negative aspect, the, 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 being, the essence of being stuck as the cue. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it comes from awareness, but... For someone that's not yet aware and has a hard time uh, being aware of these difficulties, because a lot of people do struggle with that, I'm wondering, that, that made me think while you were talking about that, is there a tool right now where you can actually practice, like it puts you in a, a fake situation that tells, this is what's happening right now, which mental models would you use? Uh, is there a tool like that? Not, 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 not that I know of. Not that I know of, and no, definitely not that I know of. And I suppose, I suppose what what you've got me thinking there was like, let's say, let's say you were to put like a skill up kind of thing. What, what you're doing, Danny? So let's just say you put an hour aside for fifteen hours to practice mental models mm -hmm. for an hour a day for fifteen weeks, fifteen days, whatever way you wanted to do it. You'd be internalizing that stuff pretty soon, and then you would see the benefits of it. Like I cannot get over how the benefits of this are immense. Like once you start thinking in this way, problems look so much easier. You start cutting the fat, you start seeing reality, you start seeing things that are about problems that aren't really problems, it was just your mind making them problems. Things that were complex become much simpler. 
and it's the practice itself of using that and that that's reinforcing in itself that's internally reinforcing which is another mental model reinforcement and reward is another mental model and it will just become naturally that's i suppose that's with the internalizing is you're being rewarded so behaviors that are rewarded are used more so it just becomes a natural um snowball effect and you'll just start using them but i think uh yeah it's all just to start um deliberate practice i think could be the key starting point for that yeah yeah, and what, once you know all these, and once you're you're good enough with them, can, can you can you think too much about them? Could you be like, is there some some like paranoia in there where like every situation you don't you you think like a robot kind of thing? It's like oh, which man and, and like the the idea of finding the right mental model to apply can it drive yeah. you nuts in some ways? Do you know what? This always comes to I'm, I'm going off the point of mental models here, but I think this is really important. And I think this is the this is the over analytic mind. And I think by default, people that are looking into mental models have analytic minds. And mm -hmm. analytic minds are correlated with anxiety. Because I suffered like, the reason why I was an addict was because of anxiety. Drugs were not a problem. It was anxiety and me over analytic minds. But for me, why I don't struggle with the point you're making there is, and I think Eckhart Tolle, who was a spiritual teacher and shouldn't be in this conversation for many reasons. He's anti-thinking. Well, he, he's amazing, by the way. I love him. But he, he, what he says, there's a difference between clock time and psychological time. I think if you use mental models the right way, you're using them to plan things, and that's clock time. I could do this, and I could do that, and brilliant. But that, that can stem into uh, analysis by paralysis. And you can say, oh, but what if I'm not using the right mental model mm -hmm. or what? And that's the... That's the psychological time. So you're thinking in the future, you're thinking through time, but it's becoming, you're, you're becoming attached to it. So it's really, that's a psychological thing that's embedded within us as well. But it's, 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 I suppose that's a different conversation, but I suppose it's just letting go. <laughs> it's the key point there. Yeah. But it could definitely happen. And I think somebody asked me that at the last corporate talk, like I was talking about the second order thinking, third order thinking, like where do you end? Hundred order thinking? You start mm -hmm. worrying, then the like you go into all sorts of worlds where the world's gonna end or whatever. Like, so you have to you have to have an element of letting it go. And I'm sure there's a mental model for that as well. Yeah, there should be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there should be. Yeah, fight, fight mental model overload with a yeah. mental model. Yeah, with a mental <laughs> model. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh god. Yeah, that's good. I um. So the third one. What, what was the name of the third one that you? Uh, oh, uh, the principles. First principles thinking. Yeah. So that one, I. I apply it all the time. So every month, I, I when I think about the skill I want to use, I break it down into its smallest component. And in one of the presentations I did here, I, I showed a, an image of uh, LeBron James um, shooting basketball. And a lot right. of people think that shooting a basketball is the smallest component you can actually get, but it's not true. There's yeah. a lot more components like jumping and Great, uh, exactly. force and, and calculating distance and yeah. flexing legs and arms and all that stuff. So to shoot a perfect basketball, yeah. you can practice all you want to just – but if you're not thinking about the smaller components, you're not going to get better. Yeah. So I love this principle, uh, especially for, for skill development. Yeah, it's brilliant, actually. That's, I'll use that one in future, Danny. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for the Pareto principle, I actually, I, th I think you might be familiar with that one. And I decided one day that I would, I would push this to the next level because I had so many uh, business ideas, project ideas that I wanted to implement. And, and I did implement a lot of them because I was like, oh, this is such a good idea. And I spent a week on it and I just abandoned it after a while. And so one idea that I came with was, I call it the 150 rule which is basically how can I do in one day 50% of the results? Yeah. So if I estimate that a project takes me a month to do to lead to 80% of the results, so Pareto principle here, if I estimate that, how do I shrink it down to one day by using things that exist already and combining them in creative ways? Uh, so with that idea, basically any, any business that I've started since then actually comes from this. So wow. scale up was built in in one day because I used Slack, I used Airtable, I used email. Uh, the things that work, the things that gave you the biggest gains, yeah. Yeah. yeah so super. now I'm working on the evolution of that, but I didn't start with what I had in mind to start with. I started yeah. with something that's super uh, easy to implement in one day. Yeah. So I love this principle. I I hope someone will write a, a mental model on this eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely.
<laughs> I'm just looking at a few questions coming in there. Yeah, we can we can answer some questions. All right, so uh, you want to read my, it out loud? Yeah, when my name comes in, that that's someone asking me a question. Is that the way that works? What do you mean? Um, so it's just saying, oh, it's sorry, that's B Remus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my bad eyesight. <laughs> I thought it was B Penny. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Sorry. So how would how should one start learning mental mental models? Pick up just one, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's you, you, your second question answers that. So, like, um, did, did, I, I talked about Michael Simmons does some great stuff on mental models. He has a mental models club. But the, mm -hmm. the article I just wrote, you'll find me on Medium, and there's links to um, the different aspects. But there, there's a book coming out called, uh, oh, there's a book coming out. There's a lot of books coming out on mental models now. Um, two big ones, um, one by Shane Parrish. That's a little bit more difficult to get into. But there's a couple of blogs out there that just is basically mental models by James Clear as well, by myself. Um, I just want done one, and it's very much based on this talk. And that's where I'd start with mental models and use one and internalize them and go from there. I, I always find that the resources that, that are out there right now are actually really complex. Yeah. I love the stuff that Michael Simmons does. Yeah. It's incredible. And I joined the club and the first thing I got was a list of, I think a hundred of those. And each of them had a hundred doc, hundred page document to explain it. Yeah. Amazing. It, it's fantastic. The amount yeah. of work and research he does. Yeah. Uh, it's just hard to assimilate for people. It spurred me on, um, which call it, it was nearly not that it was too complex for me. I, I hadn't got the time to give the mental models enough time, but when I got into Michael Simmons's work, he just broke it down in a certain way that got me more into it. And that's that's now I, and now I'm more into making it as simplistic as possible because it's not simplistic, and I'm probably overcomplicating that at times. But I think you need to do that to get people on board and then bring it to the next level. And mm -hmm. it's not that it's mad complicated. The la it's different language. It's a different. It's a different. It's a different language. It's a different way of thinking. But it's it's easy once implemented. Just keep on doing it. Act. Do you know what? Act, 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 act. Use Absolutely. them, use them, use them, use them. And then it just gets easier. Absolutely. And is there a difference between what Ray Dalio calls a principle and mental models? Are they the same thing? It's the same thing, I think. Yeah. So um, uh, it's another really way of talking about them. So one of Ray Dalio's principles would be a big one of Ray Dalio's principles is second order thinking. I think... Uh, he, he, he calls it, and geez, I'm so familiar with Ray Dalio. I read his book about two years ago. So I'm mad, mad into Ray Dalio. And, but he's always thinking about, make, one, of, one of Ray Dalio's ones is make believability-weighted decisions. And what he means is question, how do you know you're right? So that could be really looking at second order effects, check the consequence, mm -hmm. the effects of the effects. How do I know I'm right? And it comes into forced, uh, forced principles thinking, like a way of looking at the first principle, two, two ways of doing forced principles thinking is Socratic thinking. And it's questioning, your, how do I know I'm right? And that's very much in line with Ray Dalio stuff. And then it's the why, why, why. Why is that? Why is that like that? Why is that like that? And you end up getting to the what in the end. And that's where, that's the gold. That's what you need to be getting to. So I think Ray Dalio just talks about it in a way that speaks to him. And it's, it's, it, Ray Dalio stuff is complex as well. It's a, that's a deep book. It can be a really deep book. Yeah. yeah. But at the end of the day, these are all just language things. Like, uh, it doesn't mean Charlie Munger, like he admits he's not get, he's not talking about reality. He says that straight out and talking about mental models. Shane Parrish, not talking about reality. They're talking about models that work for the world. And Ray Dalio is the same. So we're really just, they're all saying the same thing in a different way. So I think the more each of them you can read and come up with your own models of life is really the way of going about it. Whatever works for you. Pragmatism works great with this. Whatever works. Yeah. And, and Ray Dalio actually pushes it to the next level where he actually builds tools uh, within his company that actually applies the models Amazing. Uh, for him. Yeah, with machine um, learning stuff as well, yeah. Yeah, based on machine learning, previous yeah. previous experience, all that stuff. I, I gave his book to someone and um, I have a highlight. It's all over with notes and I have to get it back off. Them. That's another cue. I have to get that book back. <laughs> but principles. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's all me highlights and me notes. I shouldn't have given that book. Oh, you gave it away? Yeah, well, just to alone, but I didn't get it back, but I will. <laughs> okay. I'm seeing them in two weeks. I'm going to take a note, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Danny. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been carrying that book while uh, while traveling as a nomad, and it's it's not a small book. No, it's, <laughs> it's a big book, big book. hard copy book, yeah. 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 
Uh, all right, let's look at some more questions. Yeah. Wow, Remus, you're on fire. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, read. The yeah, what do you think about mental time. models being implemented in schools? And a lot of people would say no way because it's too early. But I think, yes, 100%. And the uh, kids are learning machines. Like, they really are. And the 80 20 principle sounds sounds like it's difficult, but it's not. Like, at the end of the day, it's really it's, it's sim simplified down as do a list of what's making the big difference in your life and double down on it. That's all it's saying. So that's a great way. I suppose yeah, I think they should be taught in skills. Inversion, a very simple way of explaining things. And these tools, I suppose it's um I suppose it could be it's 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 back to learn and how to learn. So instead of teaching them the memory tests, teach them. I wouldn't call them mental models. I teach it in a different way, a more of a digestible way. I wouldn't talk about complexity or anything like that. You'd have to make it sexy in a way fashionable or a way that what uh, digest sexy and cool. I do, yeah i just realized it. <laughs> but make it <laughs> digestible and back into the soft skill stuff um pr principles and it's about yeah it's a thought i'd have to have a, a think about that of how it could be implemented but i think yes definitely implement it in skills um, I've been part of what helped you transform and who you are today. Yes, they, they, they definitely have. And I suppose some of them would have been, um, some of them would have been um, ones I've, so I'm always using inversion, even though I didn't know, but now, now I use it uh, deliberately. And that's, that's the, that's, that was the game changer for me. It's a game changer when you start using these things deliberately. I was always looking at what's priority in my life, but I didn't realize how uh, it's taking me to the next level. Uh, and my own mental model, I don't even know if it's a mental model as such, but I have a decision-making tool that's had a huge impact on my life. And it's literally, I, I just ask myself, and it's a real simple thing. It's like, I don't know, I'll, I'll try to go through it really quickly, but it's like a mantra I have in my life, and it's, does it make the boat go faster? It was literally that the British Olympic team used that mantra, does it make the boat go faster, the British rowing team, for their boat. So when they were faced with a decision, they would ask themselves, does it make the rowing boat go faster? If it did, they said yes. If it didn't, they say no. So I basically have a purpose in life, goals in life, and values in my life, and I'm very deliberate. I know exactly what they are. And when I'm faced with a decision, any decision, it's like a model in my head. I will ask myself, does it make my boat go faster? My goals at the minute is my PhD, my book, and a TV thing I'm doing. So does it make them goals go faster? If it does, I say yes. If it doesn't, I say no. My purpose in life is to show people that change is possible. Does it make my purpose boat go faster? Gives me a decision, a way of looking at the world. But then I will think about my values as well, which is compassion, humility, uh, connection, and I would say, right, does it align with me values? And that, that's a model I use for my own life to make decisions. And that has been a game changer for me of just making decisions in life. So my, I have my own models as well. And the other models, they've definitely had, had a huge part in transforming how I am today, transforming how I'm thinking and bringing it to the next level. I think that's where they're really gold. Yeah, one, one thing Brian didn't mention, but one, one goal of his, which is going to happen one day, sooner oh, or later, up. but he's going to meet this guy here. <laughs> yeah. Russell Brand, if you are watching this recorded version. We've got to meet Russell. Of course you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If well, you are, me uh, I'm, I'm going to put Brian's info in the uh, description of the video, so please make sure to reach out to him. And if, if you're watching this and you know Russell Brand, uh, let us know. Yeah, one one of the book I'm writing, Danny. Yeah, one of the chapters is called Chase. It's about mentorship and reaching out and being bold. And I'm calling the chapter Chasing Russell. <laughs> nice. Nice. You said you said bold, right? Not not bald. Bold, 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 being bold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, by by the way, uh, Brian, the um, the chat is is not in the recording. So when when you answer questions, try to. Uh... Okay. 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 Anything else you, you want to answer? Uh, I actually have some some quick questions as well. Yeah, if you we'll answer one more here, will we? Um, so ask ask us ask why until you get the truth of reality in its purest form. Either that it becomes an already get that. And by the way, man, do you know some good mental models for improving learning or anything related to it? Well, for me, all mental models is is a form of learning. That's what learning is. Yeah, but I suppose specific to just learning. I, yeah, I, I would go with the the two you mentioned, the yeah. third and fourth. Yeah, the eighty twenty, especially like like it, the bottom line is like yeah, it's great to learn, but make sure what you're learning is what's important to learn. Like 
and that, that's the I, I done I, I done really really well in college when I went back to college I done really really well my results were fantastic and it wasn't because I was the best in the class it was because I used an 80 20 analysis before I even knew what it was mm -hmm. so I looked at the exam paper seeing what they asked every year focused on that because that was the 20 percent of what was important and did not go near the stuff in the middle and I done an 80 20 analysis because I focus so it more so yeah it'll focus you on what to learn is the key piece i think yeah, that in, in languages there, there's um there's the top 100 words which are being used more than 90 percent of the time so if you yeah. learn the top 100 or top thousand words in a language you actually can speak the language and read the newspaper yeah um, it's so simple i don't know how many words there are in english uh or, or french or any languages that i speak but uh i don't need to know most of them i don't even yeah. even 20 percent of them yeah. and i write a lot obviously on, on medium and I, I i send my articles for some feedback and and our mutual friend michael thompson his is a lot better than i am in english and he goes through my articles he's like dude use this word this word this yeah, word yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't even know what they mean <laughs> you only need to know the 20 percent <laughs> yeah. well that's that's how i learned spanish like yeah by now i probably know about well, probably not twenty percent. That's that's actually still still a lot. Still a lot. Uh, I, that, say, yeah. I can have conversations uh, in Spanish all the time without any preparation. For example, I went to Quebec City uh, a month and a half ago, or maybe two months ago, and it turns out that the guy sitting next to me only spoke Spanish. No uh, way. And I was able to have a conversation with him the whole way, and that was like three hours. Amazing! Amazing! Yeah. Do you, do you want to ask, I think you had a question about creativity, Daniel. I'd like to get on to that one. Uh, yeah, this is the hard question. The, yeah, I love this one, though. And this for me, because I think you asked me ages ago, do you think it uh, in, impinges creativity? Was that the question? Uh, creative thinking. Creative thinking. Yeah, yeah, creative thinking. Yeah, sorry. And for me, well, I used to never think of myself as a creative person. And I used to get stuck on problems. And I'm, I'm not being creative. I can't laterally think. So for me, that aspect of creativity mental models improve it immensely and especially the ones like inversion or um or, or the, yeah inversion would be a big one because i just flip things i just invert things and i can think outside of the box or in a different way that'd be huge for creativity first principles thinking is like uh, reverse engineering complex problems down to its its smallest form so i think that's that just uh, it gets you to think in a different way which you could call creative thinking i suppose what we were talking about danny is what is creative thinking mm -hmm. but the key piece is we're back to eckhart again actually yeah eckhart Tolle, and a lot of people a lot of mystics and stuff would say that and einstein as well so it says that the true creative moments come in the moments of insight when you weren't thinking so maybe you're using mental models or you're using you're thinking about a problem but then when you're driving or you're in the shower it's like eureka moment so sometimes the, the 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 creative part comes right when you're not using the models but i think the models get you closer to it get you thinking about it in a different ways and open up the subconscious mind a little bit more so i think they help creative thinking but at the same time we're back nearly to the paralysis by analysis kind of thing don't get too caught up in it and let the mind wander and then let it let it be and i think that's where the enhanced creative thinking I think in some ways this is actually a mental model as well. And we, we, we have that problem a lot in software engineering where we're stuck in a problem and it happens in many disciplines, but uh, because I'm a software engineer, I'm, I'll go with that one. Yeah. And you're stuck in a problem. You can't solve it. And it happened to me yesterday. And, and you, you spent so much time thinking about how to solve it and it just doesn't work. And I went for a walk and grabbed some groceries and came back and the solution came right away yeah but it's so hard to walk even and even though that happens on a it can happen it's still so hard to walk away from the problem it's like you're giving up or something it's so strange it's so yeah. strange yeah. yeah i often do uh this should be a mental model as well but i often do uh uh when i want to be, get creative instead of being like just in front of my computer and with pen and paper or writing on the computer i do what i call a thinking shower I just go there right. and let, let let the shower do. do oh, the I have thinking. to try that. <laughs> and like, look, the thinking is just so intense because I have nothing else to focus on. Yeah. Like in front of me is water and a wall. Water. <laughs> yeah uh, some of my best uh, ideas come in the shower and yeah. by default i like to have a notepad for when i'm thinking but you can't have a notepad in the shower that's the problem 
Yeah, the weekend is so intense that like sometimes I stay there for like 30 minutes without realizing and then I jump out and then I start noting everything. Yeah, wow. Yeah, thinking shower model. Thinking shower model, I like that one. But that'll be remembered. <laughs> yeah. And it's easy to visualize as well. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Play with mental models actually because a lot of ways that we retain information is to picture something in our mind. So the thinking shower uh, idea is easy. 80 20, I guess you could picture like a, a, a pie uh, split and like missing the 20 or something like that. Yeah. But with a lot of models, I, I'm wondering if there's a way to visualize, visualize them in a way that everyone could remember them easily. Inversion, inverted pyramid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, a visualization that represents it. It's still a representation, but it's a vi even a, vi a representation of a visualization. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, actually. Like broken glass. That would be the third one. Yeah. I keep forgetting the name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the uh, first principles thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always think of Elon Musk. He just owns that now. <laughs> yeah, but it's just the word. But it just, it just doesn't get in my, in my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need something. Yeah, I got you. I got you. All right. If, if you're watching the recorded version and uh, you have tools, you've built tools to help with learning mental models, please let us know. We'll add it to the description because we all want to get better in mental models. We all want to practice, and it's it's not always easy to find the when, find the trigger, and make it happen. So if you've built a tool, let us know, and we'll include it. Would love to hear that, yeah. This was fantastic, Danny. Great chat. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for uh, coming, explaining all of that. Uh, you've answered pretty much all my questions. I, th I think I'm looking at my uh, Evernote here. I've got like 15 questions all answered. So, Super. So it's been amazing. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining, guys. Thanks for having me, Danny. Thanks, Thanks guys. Me. Brian Penny, he showed us how to use mental models and what they are and everything about mental models for dummies. So now we're not dummies anymore. Not dummies uh, anymore. <laughs> so, Cheers. Right. Cheers, guys. Uh, tomorrow.